Hello, my name is Stephen Cretney, and I'm with the West Kootenai Climate Hub. The Climate Hub brings together various local organizations and individuals to accelerate climate action in our region. We are a volunteer-driven hub that facilitates connections and collaborations, including hosting these monthly webinars. Today's topic is Young Women in Leadership, and we are lucky to have the ever-youthful Donna McDonald host today's conversation with two young women, Danica and Maya. Donna has lived in Nelson since 1972 and has worked in forestry, media, and the nonprofit social sector. She has also been deeply involved in local politics as an observer, a columnist, and as a Nelson city councillor for 19 years. Donna is the author of Surviving City Hall, a memoir of those years on Nelson City Council. Welcome, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and good day to everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited today to have the opportunity to be in conversation with two young women leaders. Both of them were elected to their community's local government, and we'll talk about that experience and with a particular focus on climate change work. I'd also like to note that this is actually Local Government Awareness Week in BC. So we're doing our bit to raise awareness of what I think is the most important level of government and at least the most immediate in our day-to-day -day lives. So first up, I'd like to introduce Danica Hammond, who is joining us from New Denver. Danica has a bachelor's degree in political science and indigenous studies and was supported in uh, those studies by one of the very prestigious Loran scholarships. She also has a master's degree in rural development and planning. And I also did note that she was um, a dedicated hula hooper during her studies. So I think that's a sign of good work-life balance. Danica has worked and volunteered in a variety of positions, including as an active member of the leadership team um, that was working on the oil and gas divestment campaign at UBC. She is currently on contract to the provincial government as an analyst in the oil and gas, or pardon me, an analyst in rural development. Um, and in October of 2022, she was elected a village councillor in New Denver. Welcome, Danica. Thanks, Donna. Also with us is uh, Maya Pro Provencal uh, joining us from Rossland. Maya has a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's in community development. She's also worked on environmental and food security issues in various positions and is currently an appointed member of the province's Young Leaders Council. In 2022, it was a big year, she was named one of the top 25 environmentalists under 25, and she was also elected to Rosalind City Council uh, that October, the same as Danica was. So she also has a small child, a three-month-old baby, Matilda, who we may hear from in the course of the webinar. Welcome, Maya and Matilda. Thank you. <laughs> so um, both of you have, have studied and worked in a, a lot of different but related areas. And I'm curious why at this point in your lives you chose to run for elected office in your small communities. What were your reasons for turning your attention to that, that, um, that area and that, that way of working within your communities on issues that you care about? Uh, Danica, how about we start with you? Sure, um, thanks Donna, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, it sounds like both Maya and I have had an interest in politics for a while, considering we both did our undergrad in political science. Um, and so I think my own story to politics, uh, it, it kind of went that in high school, I was super, super interested in like global affairs. Uh, and, and basically, I, it came back down to like federal in like later high school, early university, then down to provincial. And then I moved home and I was like, I need to focus at the local level here. Um, kind of just to see, you know, the impact of your own work and be in relation to community um, and, and connected to your neighbors and that kind of thing. Um, and so my interest in politics, as I said, you know, came down to the minutia of, of being in local government. And for me, um, looking at my council in New Denver, um, 
prior to me being elected, uh, it was a council and mayor that were consisting entirely of, of older um, white men. Um, they've done a lot for the community and, and they each have their own merits, of course, uh, but not seeing myself reflected or a younger demographic in, uh, reflected in council um, was of concern to me. I wanted to make sure that the younger generation had a voice at the table um, and also that women had a voice at the table. Um, and uh, it was quite interesting because that was quite a controversial opinion to have in my community. Um, and, uh, and, and that was difficult to deal with. But yeah, I mostly ran because I, I wanted to make sure that there was a diverse representation at the table um, and, and be able to make an impact on the local level on a variety of issues. So, yeah. And are you the only woman on your council? I am. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I did run with a friend of mine, um, who, who's also, uh, younger, uh, he's in his thirties. I'm still in my twenties. Um, and, uh, and so we, we, uh, our campaign slogan was like the next generation, um, you know, bringing a youthful voice to, to council and he was elected as well. So. Uh, Great. Yeah. Good. Good job. Maya, how about you? What brought you to local government? Yeah, um, similarly to Danica, I've always had an interest in politics, obviously having um, yeah done my undergrad in, in poli-sci. And I actually decided that I wanted to eventually run for local government. I didn't know if I was going to do it in Nelson or Rosslyn because I've always kind of been bouncing between the two communities. But I decided I wanted to do that back in 2018. So I was 19 turning 20 at the time, um, even though I didn't end up running until 2022, I wanted to wait until I was settled in one of the two communities. Um, but I decided I wanted to eventually run. Um, I was basically inspired by some work I was doing with the West Kootenai Eco Society at the time, now known as Neighbors United. I was doing a summer like Young Canada Works position with them on the 100% Renewable Kootenays campaign, which I'm sure most folks in the audience are familiar with. But if you're not, it was like this big push um, to get local governments in the Kootenays to commit to transitioning to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And I was working as like a community organizer um, in that role. And um, it was the first time that I had really interacted with local government. And it, it made me realize two things. First, like I became super acutely aware of the lack of diversity. Sorry, that's my dog trying to play with me right now. Um, the lack of diversity on our city councils, like all throughout the Kootenays. Um, in Rossland, it like I think the average age of a city councillor was pushing 60. Um, luckily, they did have like a generally good gender balance, but the age uh, representation just wasn't there. Um, and then I also realized through that work that it's actually relatively easy to have an influence or to affect change at the local level when you compare it to advocacy at like the provincial, federal, or even international level. The 100% Renewable Kootenays campaign was like incredibly successful within, I think it was six years, five, five or six years of work. They had 13 local governments committed to this renewable energy transition and this um yeah, it, it's amazing. And um, it was all because of like a really small team at Neighbors United mobilizing in our relatively small communities. And um, so that got me really excited. And I wanted to know what it would be like to be on the other side of the table, um, sort of meeting that advocacy work that uh, so many amazing people in the Kootenays were doing um, at the council table. So that's kind of what pushed me to run. Great. Okay. Well, um, and so speaking of being on the other side of the table, it is an interesting position to be in. And it's certainly um, being an elected public figure is, is a different experience than just having a regular kind of job. Um, for one thing, the pay is very poor. Um, and you don't get to choose your coworkers, right? You may end up working with people who have really different opinions and, and values than you. And things can move very slowly in government. And so it's, it's a different kind of environment probably than you, you had worked in before. How have, so I'm wondering how you've adjusted to this new environment and how you make it work for you. Maya, can we start with you? Yeah, um, I would say it's been a difficult but rewarding adjustment. Um, and I'll, I'll preface with the fact that 
I do align politically with the majority of our council. And I think that makes a huge difference. Like there's no huge outliers on our council. We all share a lot of values, which makes it easier to be productive at the council table and, and makes the adjustment a lot easier. We're not like a super polarized council. Oh my goodness. It's never ending over here. I live in a circus with a small, small baby and a small dog. Um, <laughs> But I would say that the hardest part of the transition has been transitioning from, you know, the activist work that I was doing to the council work that I'm doing now. Um, when you're an activist, you get to kind of put these like super bold and transformative ideas on the table. And then your job is to be like steadfast and advocating for those ideas um, and not backing down. Whereas when you're at the council table, like you're only one of seven votes um and so i get to put those ideas on the table and i get to lobby and i get to be like strong in my convictions but i have had to learn to compromise at some point <laughs> um and and that has made the adjustment a lot easier is becoming better at compromise um and trying to find those shared values at the council table like um an example of this is we recently passed um the zero carbon step code at the uh in rossland um, and when I and I was working with some folks from the Climate Hub on that, and we we really wanted um, to you know take the most accelerated approach to implementing the zero carbon step code, and that's what I brought to the council table. And when I first brought up the conversation, we were split about four three, so four of us um, wanted to implement it in, in an accelerated way, so ahead of what the province were doing, and three wanted to do what the province were doing. Um, but unfortunately, the four that were, you know, including me that were on this side, we had varying levels of comfortability with how much further we wanted to go from the province. And so at the beginning, I was like, let's do it. Let's go zero carbon. Um, and I had the support of the community for the most part. But I knew if I continued to advocate for the strongest approach, I was going to lose some of those four. Um, to the three. <laughs> and then we were going to end up just doing with what the province was recommending. And so I learned it was one of the, the the first big lessons on council for me was was having to compromise on that. And we ended up being able to pass something that's beyond what the province is requiring, um, which is really exciting, but it's just a little bit less than what I wanted. Um, so yeah, I would say that learning to compromise is how I've adjusted to, to the difference. Yeah, great story. That's a great story, Maya, because it, it really is that way. I, I know I went in as an activist as well and kind of went, oh, there's other people and I have to, you know, we work together and the whole notion of democracy and majority votes and all these things, majority rules, I should say, is um, can be really challenging sometimes. So yeah, that learning to compromise and, and be persuasive is so important. How about you, Danica? Yeah, I think, um... I mean, you're you're correct. The the pay is pretty low in New Denver. We have one of the lowest uh, salaries for counselors, um, even was, towns that, was, that are smaller than that ours. That's what it like is. We, uh, it's just over three grand a year. Yeah. Um, so even towns that are smaller than ours pay more. Um, but I didn't sign up for the money, that's for sure. <laughs> and actually I feel like even if it was $0, I'd probably still do it. Um, uh, I It's kind of like when I get the paycheck, I'm like, oh, right, I forgot. <laughs> like this actually isn't just a volunteer gig. Um, I think one of the things that's most challenging, and this goes back to like the idea of, of having diverse representative councils is the requirement beyond the regular meetings. And so, you know, we have meetings twice a month in the evenings and, and that's fine for me, but I'm, I'm a full-time working individual. I own a business. Um, I don't have kids at this time, but my, I'm sure, you know, you can relate to having a lot on your plate and, uh, you know, the extra committees or extra special meetings that get scheduled. Um, I find that there's, kind of a, a lack of understanding of, of like, I can't just take off time from work at any point. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, yes, it's ideal to have, you know, meetings during work hours because that's when staff is working, but it's really like the system itself is not set up for working people, which is why a lot of our counselors are in retirement age. Um, 
or are self-employed or like their own boss. So they can kind of make their own schedule, um, which is really prohibitive for other people running, which I think is, is really problematic and challenging. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm making it work, uh, trying to balance and make sure I, I, you know, I think I signed up for a committee and then I haven't been able to attend a single meeting because they're all during work hours. And I was like, Hey, never mind. I'm going to have to step back from this. Um, which is unfortunate, but it is, it's the reality of the system right now. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, kind of working with other people, I'm a little jealous, Maya, um, you know, our, our councils definitely, uh, has a more diverse range. And there can definitely be some heated and passionate debates over a variety of issues. Uh, I think the thing that I've learned, um, that's been the most useful is to, keep those debates to that topic. Uh, And so, you know, we might be going head to head on something, uh, you know, on one agenda item in particular that that's, you know, difficult and emotionally sometimes very, you know, uh, strenuous if you really care a lot about the issue, but then not letting that bleed into every single agenda item and still being able to recognize that, uh, you know, there are a lot of issues that all of us at the t- council table do agree on and do want to support um, and and being able to uh, champion those together and also like acknowledge each other's strengths and, and leadership qualities in, in different respective areas, even though we might disagree on this particular agenda item. Um, and uh, that's been something I've been really happy that I feel like we've been able to figure out, even though after the election, you know, we came together with, yeah, this very diverse group that the community honestly was like, how are you going to make this work? Like, you guys were very upset with each other throughout the whole election campaign, and it was very heated. And now you're all at the table and and what's going to happen. And I think, you know, a year and a half in we've we've shown that um, we can work together. I mean, yesterday, we were all out barbecuing for the community uh, for local government awareness week. And, and it's, you know, we we've figured out how to categorize and compartmentalize, you know, the issues in a certain way. So mm-hmm. that's that's really great because um, that those divisions can devolve into really um, personal attacks and um, and it's you know that whole notion of always stick to the issue and compartmentalize it as you say, and it's not about attacking each other like we're all human beings and we're all doing the best we can and we just have different ideas and it's especially in this general yeah. climate of, of divisiveness, it can be challenging to um, keep on Definitely. track. So well done, well done. Um, the other big aspect of, of being a, an elected person is the constant public scrutiny. And um, I mean, when I was on council, the worst thing that could happen was a phone call at three in the morning from some guy who was mad because the snowplow was beeping outside his window, right? I fortunately got out before uh, social media really ramped up. Um, but it, you know, it's a, I think social media is just a whole other experience that, that as elected people you have to deal with um, these days. And we've seen it be a pretty horrible experience for, for many women um, elected officials who've been subject to harassment and, and threats in pretty sickening and shocking ways. So. Um, I'm just curious what your experience is in, in that area, but just in general as being young women, um, what your experiences have been. Do you want to kick that off, Danica? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, previous to this, I uh, worked for Minister Michelle Mungal. Um, and so, of course, I had seen the kind of... Um, harassment and vitriol attacks that women in politics can receive both uh, online, on the phone, in person, um, in the grocery store, uh, all of that. And so I have to say that, you know, I I went in a little bit eyes open. um, And I also have to recognize that, you know, as a former activist, like within my own local community, I also understand the frustration that people have especially when they don't know how to reach their representative um, and or when they're not getting a response. And so I think like even going back to like your first question of like, why did I run? Part of the reason I ran was because I was involved in a in a campaign that became very, very heated and very controversial. Um, but the main issue was that like we weren't getting 
a, we weren't getting a response from council that acknowledged our frustration. And I think that a big part of politics that is missing is being able to acknowledge when people are upset or frustrated and be just be like, I hear you. Like, I hear that this is what is upsetting you. And, you know, maybe you can't do anything about it. Um, but just like that kind of empathy part. Um, and that was what was missing in, in my local government. Uh, you know, that's kind of why I ran was to make sure that people felt like they could be heard. And that even if I couldn't make a decision that they liked, that I could empathize with their perspective, even if I didn't hold their perspective. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I wrote a lot of letters to the editor and I think that there are different ways that you can, you know, reach out to your elected representatives that are totally appropriate and, and fair game, right? Write to the office, call, ask questions, write letters to the editor. That is totally, you know, people have a right to their opinion and a right to their, to, you know, to, to speech, right? Like they, they can talk. The problem is, is when it comes into, um, you know, approaching elected representatives uh, on their own free time. I, I find that, you know, some people, I, I'm, I've I'm been fortunate, I haven't experienced this too much, but um, I experienced this a lot with uh, Minister Mungal was like, you know, approaching in, in cafes or or interrupting like meetings, like that kind of things. And I know that other counselors that I work with or staff experience that where, you know, we live in rural communities, so you can't really go anywhere and not be known. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's challenging, you know, when someone comes up and they want to fight with you right in the street and you're like, well, like, can we schedule some time uh, and talk about this? And so there's kind of a time and place aspect. Um, I have, you know, struggled somewhat with the social media. Um, and I, and I hate that we're just expected to just have a tough skin about it. Um, and I think that what I've experienced and noticed is the inconsistent, um, standards that women especially young women are held to um than than older men for example um for instance during our debate for um the local government election uh i prepared like i you know people were allowed to submit questions and you know i had talked to some people and and, you know, some people that supported me, you know, knew what questions they were going to submit. We didn't know which questions were going to get asked, but like, I wrote a binder of like, okay, these are the questions I know that some of my supporters submitted. These are some questions that I anticipate will come up. I did my research. I wrote up speaking notes. I rehearsed them. And people said I cheated. <laughs> and, and they accused the newspaper of feeding me the questions in advance. And... I was like, I just, I just did the job. Like I just came prepared and ready for this position. Whereas the other candidates showed up with nothing. And when they were asked to give their introductory speech said that it was stupid to prepare and that they didn't need to do that. And so I got accused of cheating instead of being like, oh, you came and like actually were prepared. Um, and so that different standard, and it's kind of like, you can't win. Like, um, you know, if, 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 for some reason, you know, whether it's political values or or something that that has happened and people don't don't like you or don't agree with you, like they're going to find any reason possible to um, cut you down and and you know, uh, yeah, accuse you of things. Mm -hmm. Like I've been accused of having like nefarious, like you know, personal reasons to to address certain housing issues, and I'm like, I just want more people in my community so that our school is viable and our hospital is viable. Like, I don't see how this is like this, like personal, like, um, you know, I don't know, like agenda, like they're, they're, it's not this personal agenda of mine to like address the housing crisis. Um, so some of it, it mm -hmm. I can only laugh and, and just, mm -hmm. yeah, try to have a tough skin and then try to just listen to people like as much as I can and just be like, okay, what is it that is concerning you? How can I listen and be empathetic to your concerns and try to change the way that people communicate with each other? Cause I, I, that's all I can do really. Yeah. It's pretty fundamental, isn't it? How we communicate with each other and we're generally not yeah. doing a very good job these days. Yeah. How about you, Maya? Yeah, I, um, generally try to stay off as much as I can of like community Facebook groups now as a city councillor or 
um, if I am in those groups and I see something related to to counsel, I do my best to refrain from engaging because a lot of the time it's just not productive. Um, or if I do engage, I just say, hey, bring this to City Hall, like call us or send us an email because contrary to pro popular belief, like our job isn't to scroll community Facebook pages looking for criticism. Like there you do have a responsibility as um, a resident to go through the proper channels to engage with us if you are going to expect a response. Um, so I, I really try to hold my boundaries when it comes to engaging on social media and indulging in social media in my community because it is just it's so brutal even though we have a generally aligned council I mean we we do have great healthy debates and disagree but um, we have a great aligned council our council was voted in in a very contentious um, environment, I would say, with a lot of community members who um, had a lot of feelings <laughs> towards council. And our council was kind of viewed, even though we were a relatively new council, as a continuation of the previous council in values and in, in intentions and goals. And so we kind of inherited a bit of a reputation that we didn't even deserve or want to have. Um, and so in my like first year and a half or two years, coming up on two years of being on council, um, I have had to deal, which is our whole council, have had to deal with a lot of pressure and a lot of passion um, from the community on a number of issues, climate change sort of, but a lot of stuff around like um, housing, I would say. Um, and the way that I deal with folks really depends on how I perceive their intentions. So if I feel like somebody is has a willingness to like engage respect respectfully and productively, even if we disagree fundamentally on our values, I w will always engage with somebody. But if I feel like somebody, their intention is just to try to catch me in saying something or just like berate me until I give up, then I just set that boundary and... um. I listen to what they have to say, but I don't necessarily engage in like a big back and forth. Um, there's certainly like, I can think of a few people in town that um, I no longer engage with because of toxic experiences that I've had with them. And I think that's a reality for a lot of women um, in any leadership position. Um, but the way that I've approached more contentious conversations um, with the public is really from a place of like curiosity and and vulnerability from me, I think is really important. Um, people often struggle, I think, to draw or to create a bridge between policy and values. I think a lot of the time people see policy as policy and, and they aren't able to see like the the value base that those that like what's what values are driving us to vote in the way that we're voting and so when I can communicate that when I can communicate like oh I'm supporting this climate policy because my value that I have is I care about the environment that I want a future for my daughter um, that I care about our community and the safety of everyone in it and when I can help people understand that those are the values that are tied to the policy I think people break down their walls a little bit and, and they can engage in more productive and, and healthy conversation. And when they can see that I'm seeking to understand what values they have that are driving their views, um, that helps a lot too. So I'll ask questions like, well, why is it that you feel the way that you do? Like what scares you about this or what excites you about this? And then um, allowing them to open up in that way can be really helpful. So that's kind of how I approach that work, but it's, it's constantly evolving. I mean, having to be like the bigger person all the time is exhausting. <laughs> like sometimes you just want to like call people names and be angry, but um, unfortunately you can't do that regardless of who you are, but especially when you're a young woman in politics, because mm -hmm. like Annika was saying, like we're just held to a different standard. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Very wise words. And uh, you both have a, a great approach because that, you know, politicians are expected to listen to the people. And that, that always um, was a puzzle to me, if, you know, because usually when someone says that they mean, listen to me, <laughs> right? And so, yeah, learning how to how to you know, hold that curiosity and compassion is, is really important and also really hard sometimes. If it's of any comfort, I discovered that once I was no longer an elected person, a lot of um, businessmen in particular who, had no time for me when I was in office, were suddenly very friendly and realized that I was a person and, oh, I have a family and, oh, I, you know, have other interests. So 
it, that was um, quite amusing to me to find I had a whole, whole bunch of new friends that I didn't have before. Um, okay, well, let's move on um, to climate change. And um, Danica, you're the chair of the Sustainability Advisory Committee. Hope, I hope that's the committee that you actually get to attend meetings for. And, yes, um, it is. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and Maya, you're a member of the 100% Renewables Committee and liaison to the Rossland Sustainability Commission. So I'd like to ask both of you, and maybe we'll um, start with Danica. Um, Tell us about a couple of projects or initiatives related to climate change, either adaptation or mitigation um, that your local government's taking the lead on and, and that you feel excited about. Yeah, um, so our sustainability advisory committee was started because of the 100% renewable campaign that uh, Neighbors United did. Um, and New Denver did sign on to that commitment in 2018. Uh, and, and formed a committee, but during the pandemic, that committee stopped meeting. And so when I was elected, I went, okay, we're supposed to have a committee, like, let's, let's restart it. Like we can, we can, you know, restart this, this project and, and this commitment. Um, and so we did a call out for, for volunteers. Um, and we've been meeting, it was, it was quite funny because we said we'd only meet three or four times a year. And, and at a certain point, I think we were meeting almost every month. Um, and and basically we took you know the the recommendations from from neighbors united and went okay this is a lot to work with how do we you know kind of pare this down and and um kind of have a manageable list to put forward to council cuz uh right now you know we can't we can't begin on embarking on every possible opportunity um to reach this commitment at this time um so which ones are you know the low hanging fruit or the you know biggest bang for our buck kind of uh, projects that we can undertake. Um, and one of the things that was, um, really easy in, in practice and, and, uh, or easy to implement, and then we're going to see how much it, it does, but, but we, we put forward the recommendation that council include within our request for decision-making process, um, what are the climate impacts of this decision and, um, you know, how it will this, uh, help us towards our commitment of 100% renewable. And, and of course, you, you know, some decisions that come forward, it, it, there doesn't really seem to be any impacts to discuss, but other ones there is. And so, you know, when we when we were looking at um, our outdoor stage that we're constructing and our budget constraints, you know, there's a there was a deliberation, you know, do we go with um, a different design that doesn't use mass timber um, and therefore, you know, is not as environmentally sustainable or do we cough up the money and 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 do it the better way and we decided to to do that um so it was exciting to see like a relatively simple recommendation get implemented in a way that is now informing every decision that we make going forward um so that was a good thing i'm also going to say like one short story that is not so great um because it isn't all you know roses and wonderful things um <laughs> We're a very tiny village, and when you're working in rural communities, the capacity and uh, financial and staff is so limited, and we are constantly trying to decide, you know, what should we put on staff's plate, um, and which project has, you know, the highest priority, um, because we just, we don't have enough staff. Like, if we increase taxes by 1%, we get, you know, just over $3,000. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's next to nothing, and so we can't do everything. Um, and one of the things that was really hard was our, our committee, which is largely, you know, volunteers from the community said, well, if we're going to reach hundred percent renewable by 2050, we need to know what are our emissions right now? Like, let's start tracking them. Let's start tracking the village's fuel consumption and, and hydro consumption just to see like, okay, as the fuel's going down, is hydro going up? Like, what are we doing? Um, and so we put this forward and thought it would be relatively easy okay like let's just start start tracking numbers now um start a spreadsheet uh and and the answer was no council voted no we weren't going to do that because of the time constraints of staff and mm. and that was not high enough on the priority list to have staff start collecting that data um which was really hard for a lot of our volunteers to hear and they were already you know pretty maxed out they're on a lot of other like volunteer boards 
Um, and some of them kind of were like, well, if we don't know where we are and we don't know where we're going to get to, like, how do we do this? How do we go on the path towards 100% renewable with just kind of this hope of like, okay, when the village next needs to buy a vehicle, hopefully, you know, it will be, you know, hybrid or electric. Um, but, you know, we're not tracking at all to see, you know, what, what, where we are on that path. Um, to that commitment. And so working with the capacity constraints of a rural local government is really hard. Um, and I think that that can't be understated because uh, everybody wants you to do everything. I want to do everything, <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's not always possible. So we're making the progress that we can. Um, and the other um, mitigation thing is we've got one counselor who's super uh, stoked and passionate about fire smart. And, uh, and that's counselor Fike, um, who uh, I will just give a shout out to does a very good job of um, doing the fire smart work in, uh, in the orchard community where he lives in New Denver, but also trying to encourage other neighborhoods within the community to, to do that work as well. Um, and so that's really exciting and, and uh, has led to like, rooftop sprinkler workshops happening at the building supplies and so people come and they pay to get the all the materials they need and then um they're taught how to build one as well and so there's there's lots of really great mitigation work going for for wildfires yeah that's great um i, I really like the 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 um climate lens that you've put on all your decisions because sometimes mm -hmm. we can just make decisions and not even think about that but if you put the lens on it and ask the question, then you stop and go, oh yeah, there are some impacts here that we should think about. That's great. Yeah. And the capacity issue is such a big one. I mean, fundamentally it's, you know, local governments just don't have the tools. Um, we have very limited revenue um, creating tools available to us um, due to provincial legislation. And so, you know, pretty well every city I think faces that same struggle. I can remember learning a very good lesson from the, our city manager when I because you know council always gets excited about things and comes to meetings and go well staff should do this and staff should do that and he would sort of look at us and go okay well if we're going to do that what aren't we going to do right yeah like, there's a certain <laughs> capacity and if you add to it something's going to fall off so that I remembered that lesson very well Maya what, what's your thoughts on on uh, climate change and some exciting things happening in Rossland yeah, there's lots of exciting things happening in Rossland. We're, I think we have a higher capacity. Obviously, we're a larger community compared to New Denver. So, and just a fantastic staff at the city of Rossland, which makes a huge difference. So um, lots of initiatives come sort of from that those grassroots commissions and committees, but a lot of them are coming from staff themselves, which is really exciting. Um, even though I didn't get like 100% of the outcome that I wanted to, I'm still excited about the work that we're doing on the zero carbon step code because it is ahead of what most communities in, in British Columbia are doing. So we took um, uh, a, an approach that's really similar to the city of Nelson. They call it a step up, step back approach, um, which basically allows builders to sort of choose um, whether they want to be more advanced on the zero carbon step code, which has to do with um, whether or not essentially um, they're going to be using any natural gas infrastructure in their buildings, or if they want to be more advanced on the energy efficiency side of that build. So um, that has to do with like how much energy does that building actually need to use to be heated and cooled and, and run. Um, and so we we're ahead on both step codes from um, the province and um, expect to be at the highest level of the zero carbon step code in the next like one to three years. Um, staff basically just wanted to give builders um, a chance to catch up a little bit and try not to create too much of a resistance from them um, in the process. So I'm still really, really excited about that um, and grateful that you know, that work did start from the Sustainability Commission before the Zero Carbon Step Code was even created by the province. The um, commission came forward and said they wanted council to ban natural gas use in new builds. Um, and then that ultimately um, snowballed into us um, passing the Zero Carbon Step Code approach. And so that's really exciting. Um, our staff are doing really awesome work around natural asset management that has been recognized by um national organizations in Canada. Um, and that's all about 
um, recognizing the value of natural assets in our community, um, like our watersheds and our forests, and actually placing like a monetary value on those assets so that people can um, appreciate them a little bit more. And so that we can point and say, hey, we should protect this forest because it provides X amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars in services to the community. And we can make a plan on how we can steward those assets going forward, like indefinitely. Um, so that work is really exciting. And um, perhaps like the biggest thing that we're working on right now is um, a comprehensive climate action plan. So the city of Rossland has had some level of a plan to address climate change all the way back to 2008. And every few years, it seems like some new plan or initiative or program comes forward. Um, and But we've never really created like a comprehensive document that aligns all of the commitments that we've made since 2008 um, and figures out sort of how to marry all of those commitments in one comprehensive plan going forward. So we're working with a really awesome engineering firm um, here in Rossland to come up with like a real climate action plan that I think is going to be really helpful for me as like somebody who's advocating for climate at the council table to be able to point to this plan like anytime we're having this conversation and being like look like we've invested however many dollars into making this plan um and this is how like what i'm advocating for aligns with that so i'm really excited about that and for anyone who's living in rossland like there's going to be some engagement with the community around that plan coming up in the summer so watching out for that is a great idea because we always like to hear from the community um but yeah just need to shout out staff um because so much of the awesome work that we're doing that's considered sort of leading in our region and in the province is because of how dedicated our staff are at the city of rossland and i think that that also comes down to the strategic direction that council's giving them so it's all mm -hmm. it's all an ecosystem that's resulting in some really awesome work yeah that's brilliant yeah and i think good point to uh, to shout out to staff because they um, they are so important and and for the most part can be really, really helpful and make things happen that we want to see happen. So that's great. Um, I'm just gonna check in with Stephen. Do we have any um, questions or should we just keep talking? Keep, keep talking. There's no no questions in the chat. Um, there might be questions that people have, but this is so great. Please just keep talking. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so when, you, when you're talking about um, consolidating your plans, Maya, and, and, and having, kind of one plan, I can't help but think about the, um, the regional district of Central Kootenai, which recently uh, attempted the same thing and faced um, opposition from some very vocal people who don't believe in human change, human caused climate change, or maybe even climate change at all. And, and the regional district responded by going into a whole year long process. And, um, and, and instead of a, a plan, they have ideas now climate ideas. So it's a, it's an interesting thing because I think I always experience the regional district as much more of a, a kind of populist level of government where um, the elected people have very little power in fact that they often have to go take you know have a referenda or uh, alternative approval processes or something whereas in look in municipalities we're elected to lead and you know how we do that of course is important but the fact is we can we can be leaders. We can say, this is really important for our community. Let's agree to do it and do it without having to consider whether we have to take it to referendum unless it's you know a big financial hit or something. So it's um yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see what are you anticipating opposition um in, in Rossland to to your plan? Um, generally, no. I mean, there's always going to be a few people, I think, that um, that are going to make noise about it, but I don't think to the same level that they're seeing at the regional districts. Um, and that maybe, like, I, I know Nelson saw quite a, has, has seen quite a bit of resistance. I think in Rossland, we have a little bit less of that polarization around climate change, which is, which I'm really grateful for. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I was, I was, uh, speaking at a panel earlier this week, um, where somebody asked a question about uh, polarization and about, you know, resistance to climate action. And somebody said um, that they like to reserve um, their time for people that 
disagree about the solution, but agree on the problem, um, because that's where a lot of the most productive conversation can happen. Mm. And I think when, as, as local governments, we sort of give in to that pressure from people that disagree on both the problem and the solutions, it really sets us back. As much as I think community engagement is so important, there has to be to come a point where we say like, okay, well, we're obviously on such completely different pages and, and we know that this is a problem. If you want to have a conversation about solutions, you can come back to the table, but, but we need to move forward. And so hopefully we can see that from some of the other, uh, yeah, gov governments in our region. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting approach. Danica, you have any comment on that? Um, yeah, I think that we would probably, uh, see a bit more, um, yeah, uh, complaints if we were to try to implement our own, like, full-on climate action plan, um, and I think we don't have the capacity to do that. So in some ways that's a blessing, I guess, uh, because we can only really like kind of tackle like one little bit at a time. Um, but yeah, it, there's definitely, um, a line I think. And I really like what Maya was saying, but like, you know, if, if we're, if we're debating the solutions to the problem, like that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but if 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 you don't believe in in climate change at all or in in human caused climate change, uh, it's very hard to find common ground to actually work towards. Um, and I think uh, I really like the um, session that uh, uh, Selkirk College puts on sometimes, which is like the dance of polarization or whatnot. My mm. I think AKBLG you were there, um, and it, and it is it, you know. There are ways I think that we can try to connect to people. Um, I actually spent a summer during my undergrad working at the World Health Organization in Geneva in their air pollution unit. Um, and, you know, like there's a lot of data and, and information about there about the health concerns of climate change, right? Like, and the health concerns of wildfires. And, um, and so it's like, you know, maybe the problem isn't that um, you know, the sea turtles are going to die from plastic. Like maybe you can't, someone can't relate to you on that. Right. And that that's a problem. Um, but they're probably going to relate to you on the fact that wildfire smoke is going to be bad for their kids' health. Um, and so, you know, trying to frame the problem in ways that you can still find connection with people about, you know, shared issues, not saying it's easy, not saying it's easy. Um, but uh, I, I think my, yeah, my summer working in the air pollution unit definitely gave me, you know, some other things to think about and, and cost as well. Like we're living in an affordability crisis um, and it's really hard because people are very mad about mm. the carbon tax. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, a lot of people. Um, yeah, thanks. Courageous dialogues. There we go. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and, and they don't want to have a carbon tax, but it's also like, and that's because they're, they're, they're struggling to make ends meet. But taking action on climate change will save us money in the long run. Like there are cost savings. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, how how do we make addressing climate change, um, you know, valuable to people in terms of their wallet? Um, and it's really hard because one of the things that I find is there's so many rebates um, and incentives, which are fantastic, you know, whether it's for retrofits or for electric vehicles or e-bikes, but it's like you always have to put up so much money at, at at the front and and one of the things that i am critical of is is a lot of those programs are almost like a rich get richer scheme where it's like you have to have so much money already mm -hmm. to be able to access the incentives to get the thing that's then going to save you more money um and so how do we embed affordability um and income inequality into climate action and make sure that the solutions are for everyone and not just people who have you know that initial investment in order to access rebates. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be one thing yeah. that I think I, str yeah. I struggle with in, yeah. in when it comes to the solutions. <laughs> uh, I'm going to yeah. jump in here uh, okay. simply because there's a few questions that I want to uh, pr provide or, or have you guys 
provide some answers to. Um, Sally had asked, what advice would you give even younger women looking at the possibility of running for an elected position in their future? What advice for potential people, young women, running? All right. You, you want to jump in there, Danica? Yeah, sure. Hi, Sally. Uh, happy to see you here. Sally is not a relative of mine, even though we both have the last name of Hammond. Um, yeah, so in terms of younger women who are wanting to in get engaged, um, my biggest uh, recommendation is to say yes to opportunities um, and to take initiative. Um, I think that, uh, you know, young women, we kind of have to fight to get our foot in the door and our, and our, you know, place at the table. Um, and so, you know, the best thing you can do is to put yourself out there and, and, you know, volunteer for things, sign up, ask people for advice. Um, Laura and I were reminiscing because back in high school, I, I spent a week working at Alex Adamanenko's MP's office in Castle Gardens and stayed with Laura um, for that time. Um, and it's, it's opportunities like that where, you know, you're, you're learning and you're absorbing everything that you could possibly do, but you're also like getting your name out there, meeting critical people, um, that can help open doors for you and that kind of thing. So, um, I would, I would just say, just go for it and put your, you know, put yourself out there and try not to be afraid. Um, and I know that's probably easier said than done because I've always been like someone who wasn't very, you know, shy or afraid of public speaking or getting out um, <laughs> into different circles. Um, but I think it really helped, you know, just like re cold calling people and being like, hey, I want to come and shadow in your office for a while and learn what this politics business is about or, um, you know, signing up for campaigns and saying, well, what can I do to help? And when they said, hey, who can take on this role? And nobody's doing anything being like, you know what, I'm going to do it. Um, and that's how you gain experience um, and and start, you know, uh, learning and figuring things out. Um, but also be kind to yourself. It's a really tough world out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and making uh, sure that, you know, you have support networks and, uh, and, and that you're not um, putting yourself too much at risk in some ways. Great. Great advice, Danica. Maya, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would say don't give in to the imposter syndrome, especially if you do get elected. You're there because, I mean, it's a democracy because people want you to be there and thus your voice matters and you're doing a disservice to the people that voted you in. If you do give in to the imposter syndrome and silence yourself or change who you are at the council table to be perceived in a different way, um, and, and use your youth as a strength um, when you are at the council table. I feel like um, I've, you know, I've, I'm sometimes uncomfortably vulnerable doing council work and, and people aren't used to that. People aren't used to um, the sensitivity or um, the casualness or the vulnerability that I bring, um, but it's, but it's effective. And at the end of the day, people appreciate it. They appreciate my candidness and, um, and so, yeah, don't change yourself and don't, and don't get into that, that, um, imposter syndrome. And just as like practical advice, if you're looking to run in an election, I would say get involved in organizations that are doing grassroots organizing, especially like really strong, like relational organizing, um, and learn from them. Um, because that work really helped when I was doing my campaign. I mean, I ended up getting more votes um, than the mayor in Rossland, which is like unheard of. Usually a lot of people vote for the mayor and they don't vote for any councillors. But I got like 300 more votes than Andy Morrell. Um, and that's because I came into it with really a really strong foundation of relational organizing. Like I doorknocked, I had conversations with people. I, I built a team of volunteers, which most people don't do when they're running um, in the elections in small towns. And so, um, yeah, I would say definitely find organizations that are doing that work and, and look for mentors and learn from them because you'll do yeah. well in a campaign if you do. Yeah, that's great advice. And I would, I would just add, um, you know, look, look for a mentor, an ally, a supporter, one or more of them um, to, to, to guide you to be the shoulder you cry on or whatever, whatever you need. But um, if you can find someone, a woman who's experienced, um, even, even better to, uh, to be your support. Okay. That is so great. Thank you. Um, 
I've got a uh, a young daughter who's just going to be starting her high school career, and she's so into environmental and social justice, and and you know whether or not she'll ever go for politics, but just wanting to do that work. And what you, the three of you, have just said, well, I will be sharing that with her, and and uh, yeah, hoping that it'll, it will make a difference and and help her and her endeavors of of leadership like like you guys um there is one other question in the in the chat box or from uh greg amos wondering if you're familiar with the bc wide uh sue big oil campaign um i you know don't really have to answer that right now because it is a, a very specific question but if you don't know about the sue big oil go find that out uh and we do have um the the climate hubby as a supporter of this so heck yeah um yeah, if I can just interject real quick, I just, not to put you guys on the spot, I just wanted to quickly uh, just put the bug in your ear, ask if you've heard about it. Just quickly, have you both heard about it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to answer that right question. Because um, okay. uh, it, it was recently passed in Slocan. Um, exactly. And yeah. supported there, which is fantastic. Uh, Maya's example of um, the step code and, and, you know, worrying about you know, losing her four people if she pushed too hard is exactly the kind of boat that I'm in. Um, and so I, you know, definitely would be supportive of joining the campaign. Uh, can't speak for the rest of my council. And and I'm kind of trying to see when would be the right time to put that forward so that it doesn't just uh, get uh, voted against because it's uh, not super easy to bring things back up again if they fail. Um, and so you have to be a little bit strategic about when and how uh, these kinds of things come forward. Which which actually Just, brings up a, a more important question, like, and I'm not to, to take this over, Greg, but is around how can being in an activist role that I'm in and that, that, that you know, that I, we're working a lot with various organizations that are trying to get various levels of government to do things, are there appropriate times or the best ways for, you know, whether it's Greg with Sue Big Oil or anything else with the, the Neighbors United when they were doing 100% um, renewables, that, uh, yeah, that, that can approach you um, to try to take this on or, or bring it to your councils to support? Are there other best practices or, or things that campaigners and, and things out there should be at least a little bit aware of in the last one minute that we have. <laughs> Maya, do you mind? Because I've got like a perfect answer for this. Um, what Neighbors United did with the 100% Renewable campaign was perfect because they did all of, they used their capacity to gain the public support and that data to show that the commitment was supported amongst the community. And so one of the problems we face with our lack of capacity is when something kind of controversial or innovative and kind of on the edge comes forward, the easier answer is to say no, if you don't know how strongly people would support it or not. And so, you know, other advocacy groups, if you can come in and help with your volunteers and with your capacity to demonstrate that the community supports it, um, instead of us directing staff to do a survey, uh, this is very helpful. Yeah. Great. Yeah, well, was, you know, sorry, okay. go ahead. Well, go for it, Donna. I'm just, just going to close up. So <laughs> <laughs> you just need, you know, you need to do your homework and you need to know who the, you know, get to know the people on council and, and, and how they're thinking and, and yeah, be very strategic. And I think getting the community support is obviously brilliant if you can manage that. Um, but yeah, it's really knowing your council and not assuming that they're going to do this or say that, or that they're whatever kind of person or whatever, but really approach with an open mind and, and, uh, and an open heart, because these are very, personal issues, um, climate change in particular is very personal for all of us. So um, yeah, there, we, we need to approach them as human beings together. Well, well, thank you all three, Donna, Danica, and Maya, for for coming today, for having this conversation. I really quite like this format. Uh, that was really engaging the whole time. I honestly think we could have went for another, you know, hour and I would have got so much out of it. So Thank you for coming and uh, uh, look forward to hearing from you all in the future. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah right. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Donna thank and Laura, you. too. Yeah. Thank you both. All right. Our next uh, last 
uh, webinar of the year. It's June not 21 about wildfires. So feel free to register and uh, sign on everyone. And with that, have a have a great May long weekend. <laughs> Thank you.